This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 328 was recorded on June 16th, 2022. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy and a one-stop shop for all green energy investors. Energy markets guru Dr. Anas Alhaji returns as this week's feature interview guest. We'll be taking a deep dive on energy markets, particularly oil and gas. We'll discuss Russia's war campaign, OPEC Plus spare capacity or lack thereof, Europe's dependency on Russian natural gas, and how much U.S. exports can really ease that dependency, and much more. Then be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment after the feature interview when Patrick's chart deck will be titled Sizing Up the Liquidity Event Risks. And I'm Patrick Serezna. Eric, let's jump to that S&P 500. The Fed goes out and gives a 75 basis point like the market wanted. The rally lasted exactly one hour. And then by the uh, Asian session overnight, we were already selling. And here we are uh, down 112 points at the time of recording, under 3,700. What do you make of this? Well, last week, I said that I'm coming around to a worse than 2008 bearish view on the economy and markets. But it all hinges on whether I'm right that inflation isn't really as transitory as most people think. Well, the very next day, the CPI overshot expectations and the bottom fell out of the market and we've been selling off ever since. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm right about inflation being secular and headed toward runaway inflation. This is complicated and the jury is still out. There's not enough data yet. But if I am right, 2022 will be remembered as the year we finally paid the price for 10 years of recklessly accommodative monetary policy. And I think that things could get pretty darn ugly. But again, it hinges on whether or not inflation is really starting to run out of control. If they can get inflation under control, that negates my view. All right. Well, let's uh, move on to the dollar index. Uh, Surprisingly, uh, the dollar index is in a bit of a correction today, which is not what I would have typically expected to see in this environment. But uh, here we are just under 104 uh, in a pretty solid full point pullback here in the Dixie. Is this just a market correction in your mind? Has anything changed? Well, I am puzzled, too, about the correction happening today. One thought that comes to mind is that today is crude oil options expiration. The dollar and crude oil tend to be inversely correlated. So if somebody is pinning oil in one direction or another, and boy, it was a doozy overnight. We were you know, down four bucks and up four bucks uh, in, in the matter of eight hours or so in the overnight session. So uh, it could be that it's related to some options expiration. I don't really have an explanation otherwise, but that breakout to a a new high well above the previous five-year high was very significant. I was expecting once we saw that breakout that there might be a little brief test of the breakout zone and then a move higher. We're testing a little lower than just the breakout zone, so we'll see what happens here. Maybe it's a false breakout, but I, I'm still very bullish in the long run. If this was not the breakout, if this was just a fake break, I still think the breakout is coming. It just hasn't uh, happened yet. And frankly, that would be consistent with what I've been expecting, which is I thought it would take a while to consolidate below the uh, previous high before we got a sustained move higher. And so far, this move is not being sustained, but let's keep an eye on it and see what happens. All right. Well, uh, let's move on to crude oil. We had a sell-off this morning, got down to almost 112 on the downside, looked like oil was uh, succumbing to the rest of the uh, weakness in the whole risk on market. And suddenly uh, we got an intraday reversal and we're back to 117, $5 higher. Uh, Was that it for a market correction? Like, How do you size up this oil swing? Patrick, we've got Anas Alhaji this week as the feature interview guest. It's going to be an oil-centric interview. So in the interest of not stealing Anas' thunder, I'm going to stay away from the big fundamental picture and just focus on the things that have changed since we recorded that interview on Tuesday afternoon. The market subsequently went down more than $10 and back up $5 this morning, and it looks like still headed higher. 
So let's talk about EIA inventory and the tape action over the last couple of days and save the big picture for Honest. EIA inventory came in with crude oil's headline build of 2 million barrels. Oh boy, a very much needed build. But wait a minute, the headline number doesn't tell you that there was also a 7.7 million barrel drawdown from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. So on a net basis, including the SBR, it's really a 5.8 million barrel drawdown, not build. But the headline number is a 2 million barrel build. Cushing, Oklahoma, drawing down 826,000 more barrels. Remember, we'd already fallen below 25 million last week, and we're still headed lower. Gasoline, the 11th weekly draw in a row, down another 710,000 barrels. Distillates was the lone build on the board. That's plus 725,000 barrels. This is the lowest stocks that we've ever had for this time of year ever, and summer hasn't really even gotten going yet. U.S. production finally ticked up another 100,000 barrels to 12 million barrels even. That's after holding 11.9 million barrels for, I, I lost track of how many weeks it was. Meanwhile, President Biden this week sent a threatening letter to big oil CEOs, first blaming Vladimir Putin for the price hike in oil, as if Biden policy had nothing to do with this, which is kind of nonsensical. But he then went on to kind of threaten them and say the White House would use all of the tools and resources that it has available in order to correct what it sees as an injustice in the excessive profits that big bad oil companies are making. Now, in reality, the situation that we have is that Biden policy has crippled the entire oil industry, which we need very, very badly. And what President Biden is doing about it is recklessly selling off the Strategic Petroleum Reserve at a time when it looks like we're going to need it, because we do seem to be headed toward an escalating conflict between the global superpowers. So it's... A really getting political. I want to save the rest for Professor Anas Alhaji, so we'll touch on oil again in the post-game segment after the feature interview. All right, well, let's move on to gold, because while almost all assets are uh, suffering and all sectors are, are dropping, the one area that uh, seems to be resilient today has uh, been gold, which is up uh, $30 to 1850 And while certainly not a new bull trend in gold, it's certainly not uh, suffering from the, the rest of the market declining in this condition. Do, do you think that's uh, significant in any way, or is it just uh, intraday noise? Honestly, Patrick, I think you're cherry picking one good day worth of data from several bad days. If you look at the big picture here, when CPI overshot, so we, we figure out that inflation might not be transitory after all, stocks tanked and gold was up. So we saw a breakdown of that usual correlation between gold and stocks, and they moved in inverse directions, but only for one day. And then they traded down and down hard together. So yeah, in the last couple of days, we're, we're up nicely on gold, but we've still only made back half of the sell-off that's occurred, as far as I can tell, in sympathy with the stock market. And I think that where we're headed on gold is if the stock market crashes, and a stock market crash hasn't even begun yet. What we've seen so far has been a very orderly even if pronounced sell-off. I think 2022 could be remembered as the year everybody remembers is, you remember 2022? That was that crazy year where the first 20% down in the stock market was really orderly and everybody thought it was over and then it really got ugly from there. Well, if it gets really ugly from here and we see the bottom fall out of the stock market, I think it takes gold with it. When that finally bottoms, though, very much as happened in 2008, that should be the buy opportunity of a century. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not uh, actually, I haven't sold a single ounce of gold. I'm planning to hold my position because you never know when you speculate about these things. I, I don't want to lose the position I've got. But if it plays out the way I expect it to, and we see gold down a few hundred bucks from here in a stock market crash, uh, I'll be buying a lot more when that happens. All right, well, let's uh, leave it with uh, touching on the 10-year Treasury yield, which uh, worked its way higher all the way towards 3.5%. Uh, certainly stalled there for a day or two after the FOMC, but uh, really, uh, higher yields are here. I mean, is, do you think we see 4%? 
Well, Patrick, as our regular listeners know, I've been saying for many weeks that as soon as you see a sustained move above 3%, get the popcorn out because it could move very quickly from there. And sure enough, we've gone in a week from, I don't think we actually traded over 3.5% yet, but I I think it was above 3.4% earlier today. And you know, let's see what happens. By the time this airs, a few hours from now when we're recording, maybe we'll be at 3.6%. Uh, I'm trying to remember who the guests are. I think there have been a couple of them, Russell Napier and maybe Harley Bassman, who had said, watch out for 4% on the 10-year. That's kind of a critical level where the economy just doesn't have the capacity to tolerate those kind of interest rates without getting into serious recession. So I think a decade of recklessly accommodative monetary policy has finally caught up with the market. And I only see two possibilities here, Patrick. Number one, there really is no free lunch in finance, and the Fed has finally pushed the limits to the point that the price must be paid for all of that reckless policy over the last decade. The outcome could easily be much worse than 2008, and it would come in the form of an inflationary rather than deflationary crisis. So it would be different parameters than 2008, but I think it could be much worse. The other option is Ben Bernanke really did invent financial perpetual motion in 2008, and MMT is about to bring us decades of prosperity because there really is an unlimited free lunch and you can print money without consequence. Uh, I think that 2022 is going to be remembered as the year we find out what the answer is to this debate as to whether or not Bernanke and Yellen set us up for a big fall that ended up taking several years to play out before the penalty was actually paid. Feels to me like we're getting really close to the point where we're going to pay that penalty. So the real story here is that thematic story I just described, but the best barometer to gauge that story and how it's playing out is the 10-year yield. And as you said, look at how quickly it's moved from 3% to almost 3.5%. Now, I think the most important thing Jay Powell said in the FOMC presser was that the reason that the Fed focuses primarily on core inflation rather than headline inflation, which everybody else cares about, is because the two tools the Fed has available to fix inflation don't work on food and energy inflation, which are outside of their control. Patrick, as if payback for a decade of reckless monetary policy wasn't enough, I think we have a perfect storm brewing for runaway food and energy prices starting this summer. This perfectly fits the fourth turning blueprint. Just as people thought in the last fourth turning that the Great Depression was the big bad event that would define that fourth turning, and then they realized at the end of the fourth turning that no, actually World War II was the much worse event. I think we had at the beginning of this fourth turning the great financial crisis starting in 2008. Everybody thought that was the big bad thing. I think that what may be coming in terms of an inflationary food and energy crisis which results in a lot of hunger and famine around the world, could be coming. I'll elaborate on that perfect storm after the feature interview because I want to build on some of what Anas has to say. This week's feature interview guest is energy consultant and keynote speaker, Dr. Anas Alhaji. Eric, why did we invite Anas back to the show this week? Patrick, Anas is one of my favorite oil market experts, and he's incredibly well-connected in the Middle East. A lot of the OPEC ministers are personal friends of his, people he has lunch with, and he he travels over there, he uh, speaks the language, the, the whole bit. So he's one of the guys that I really have a lot of faith in, and I wanted to get his perspective because I think that the energy crisis is just beginning. Everybody's talking about these crazy high energy prices have to come down. I think they're just getting started. Let's see what Anas has to say in this week's interview. Well, Eric's interview with Anas is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. If you invest to bring about a world powered by green energy, you should meet Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy that serves as a one-stop shop for green energy investors in Europe. Respect Energy brings together independent power producers, accredited and institutional investors holding assets in renewables, or undertaking investments in new green energy production, such as wind and solar photovoltaic power plants. 
More than 600 institutional and accredited investors have already entrusted Respect Energy with the sale of their electricity production, portfolio management, O&M services, EPC, and project development. If you want to invest in green energy in Europe with the help of a trusted partner, contact Respect Energy today and ask for a tailor-made solution. For more information, visit respect.energy. And now, with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Dr. Anas Alhaji, energy markets consultant, former instructor at the Colorado School of Mines and University of Oklahoma, and one of our favorite oil market experts. Anas, it's great to have you back on the show. It's been way too long. Let's start with the big picture of where things stand right now. A lot of people are wondering why OPEC hasn't done more to increase production in order to bring prices down. Uh, my take is OPEC is basically out of spare capacity capacity and maybe doesn't want to admit that, although they have admitted it to some extent. What's your take? What's going on here? What is the, uh, the major factor that is keeping prices so elevated? Thanks, Eric. And uh, it's really great to be on your show again. Uh, we got to look at the mix of economics and politics together when we talk about OPEC and OPEC Plus and their decisions. As you know, we ended up with this OPEC Plus since 2016, where 10 members, including Russia, been added to OPEC, and that's why we, we ended up with OPEC Plus, which has 23 countries. It is led by Saudi Arabia and Russia. And this coalition is not only about changing oil production or uh, oil market. The coalition between Saudi Arabia or the Gulf states and Russia is way, way stronger than that, and we've seen it in recent months. And there are many reasons for that. Uh, if you think about it, and if people are wondering why the Saudis and uh, others in OPEC did not really take a strong stand against Russia, think about it this way. The Saudis have a problem in Yemen, and there were resolutions in the Security Council against the Saudis. And who did the veto? Russia. Uh, there was a resolution in the Security Council that the UN Security Council on climate change that would have destroyed the economies of the oil producing countries. Who did the veto vote? It was Russia. So in a sense, all of a sudden, uh, OPEC members and the GCC countries that the Gulf Cooperation Council in the Gulf have a veto power within the UN Security Council, although they are not member of it. So why let Russia go when they have this power? So there are really kind of, uh, of course, there are other reasons uh, when it comes to climate change, carbon tax, how to stand to the uh, extremists on climate change in Europe, etc. It is really Russia who can do that. And in fact, if you look around, you find out that Putin single-handedly, without intention, has delayed all the climate change policies of Europe for at least seven, eight years which means that we have an additional oil demand, we have additional gas demand that's not being counted in any outlook, and probably within the next few months, as we see the long-term outlook coming out of the International Energy Agency, OPEC, and the oil majors, we are going to see a revision, an upward revision to oil demand as a result of the failure of those policies simply because of Putin. So this coalition basically is a very important coalition, and that's why everyone was sticking to it. So they agreed to increase production by a certain amount, which was 400,000 at the beginning, and then when they changed the base uh, later on, it's 432,000 barrels a day every, every month. Uh, and they've been going with this and sticking to it as they go. When Putin went to uh, Ukraine, there was pressure on those countries to increase production. If they increase production, then they are going to anger Putin, and then the coalition will collapse. They already invested a lot of money and a lot of capital, political capital in it. They don't want to lose that. So they decided to stick to the plan, increasing production, and that's it. All of a sudden, about 10 days ago, when they had, um, probably more than that, uh, when they had the meeting, they decided to forward the end of the agreement. The agreement will end at the end of September, where they can recover all the production cut so they can go back to pre-COVID production by the end of September, at least in terms of ceiling, not in terms of actual production. 
and that's what the agreement. All of a sudden, they decided to end it at the end of August. If they end it at the end of August, then what you are going to do with the production of September? What they did is they took the increase in September, divided it into two halves, and they added it, added one half to July, one, uh, one half to August, and that increased the amount of the ceiling from 432 to 648. There are many explanations for that. Some people think they are extending the olive branch to President Biden, that look, we are, we are already increasing production, look what we did. At the same time, they were expecting Biden to visit, but they did not know when. But if he is going to visit in July as planned right now, because he's supposed to be in Saudi Arabia on the 15th and the 16th of July, by the time they increase production, it will be September. So it makes perfect sense if they want to increase production in September, because they are free. There are no quota in, in, in September. So they can really extend an olive branch to Biden and ex increase production. The only thing is most of that production is not going to see the market simply because we are talking about production. We are not talking about supplies. We are talking about production. We are not talking about exports. Summer demand for oil increases in those countries because they need additional power generation to uh, meet the cooling demand. And this does not apply only to, to the Gulf nations that apply to nations in North Africa, such as Algeria, for example, or uh, nations in Latin America or other places, they need the extra demand. Uh, of course, there is winter on the other side. But the idea here is they, there is extra demand uh, and it's domestic demand. So their exports may not increase at all, although they are ex uh, increasing production. Do they have the capacity to increase production? Uh, yes, they still have between uh, UAE, uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait and Iraq, uh, probably they still have about 1.6 million barrels a day of uh, what we call effective effective production capacity, which means that they can bring online within uh, 90 days and sustain it. So we still have about 1.6 million barrels a day of spare capacity. Okay, Anas, but as I understand things, right now, OPEC Plus is not producing even at the level of its current quotas. They seem to have changed their messaging to where they're no longer using the word quota and they're using target instead. It sounds to me like the game has changed and where we used to expect OPEC Plus producers to basically lie and cheat if they could get away with it and exceed their quotas if they could possibly manage not to get caught doing so. It seems like now they're struggling to meet those quotas. Uh, quotas, which now they've begun to describe as targets rather than quotas. Uh, this all, to me, spells a, a story of OPEC Plus struggling to increase its capacity. And by your description, you know, 1.6 million barrels, that's not very much. So what happens if we need 5 million barrels of extra capacity to meet demand? Uh, where is that going to come from? Sure. Uh, so uh, let's go back to your original point here. The focus on the quota or the, what I call the ceiling here is a mistake. This is not an issue. No, no one from the beginning basically believed those numbers, or, but we focus on the actual increases. We knew from day one that some countries cannot increase their production. But let's face it, OPEC changed dr drastically. OPEC plus changed drastically. The most important news in 2021 in the oil market was not covered by the media. What was... The big news, the big news basically is this, that for the first time in OPEC history, major oil producers with spare capacity decided to stick to their own quota and not compensate for others. That was a major, a major change in market structure, a major change in policy, but the media ignored it. What that means is Saudi Arabia will increase production only by its quota Historically, it did, it did compensate for those who cannot do it. So the idea here is that we should not focus on the quota or the ceiling. We should focus on the increases in, in production that was uh, literally known before. In fact, we already knew that who, those who cheated earlier, they have to compensate. And they knew months ahead of time that if they don't compensate, they wait until the ceiling goes up, they will naturally compensate, and then they are in compliance. So there is no problem with this here. Regarding the 1.6 million, 
at least we are covered for this year. We have no problem. If you look at the remaining increase in demand without having a recession versus what's available, we have no problem uh, at all. The problem, of course, is what's going to happen to the Russian exports and Russian production. Luckily, it's been increasing, but will things change? We don't know. We'll see how, how, how the Russian production is going to go and export. All we are seeing right now is we are seeing changes in the direction of trade worldwide, and we are seeing swaps. The Russians are playing it very smart. They are selling to, as you know, at discounted uh, prices to India and China. Uh, they are going to sell to other OPEC Plus members. We are going to see swaps with Iran and other OPEC members. We are going to see some OPEC members buying uh, Russia, uh, Russian fuel oil during the summer while they export their own instead. So everyone is going to cooperate with Russia to circumvent the sanctions. Anas, let's talk about what's going on in Russia and how their production is going to affect the global market. Because on one hand, you can make the argument that, hey, if, if they take four or five million barrels of Russian uh, exports off the market, well, somebody else has to make up for that. But then you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. If they're going to sell some of that oil to India and China, perhaps at a discount, well, that's oil that India and China don't have to buy from Saudi Arabia and other OPEC producers. So it really hasn't come off of the market. It's only come off of the Western market. That may affect prices, but it's not as dramatic of an upset as if it was totally off of the market. So let's start with the, the picture of Russia now, but I also want to integrate into this what happens in the fall when Europe really, really, really needs that Russian gas? Supposedly, President Biden is going to export a whole bunch of U.S. gas on ships that don't exist through export terminals that don't exist in order to solve the problem. We know that's not the solution. So what's going to happen with Russia and their production as we get into the fall months when Europe really needs gas for heating purposes? Sadly, Europe has become a political football between Russia and the U.S. and China and the rest of the world. What's going to happen, Eric, and this is kind of, it's already happening, but people do not believe it until it's published by Bloomberg and Reuters for some reason. What's been happening is India been buying the Russian cheap, the, the cheap oil from Russia and then re-exporting it to Europe. What we are seeing right now is China and Russia buying more and more Russian crude, refining it in China and Russia, and exporting the products to Europe at the higher price. So Europe has become a political football. Let's look what, uh, what's been happening right now, because the idea that there is a competition between Russia and Saudi Arabia and the rest of OPEC is nonsense. Uh, Saudi Arabia already announced they are going to cut their exports to China so Chinese teapot refiners can go and buy Russian crude. And the Saudis basically will, will start exporting to Europe. So everyone is playing the game because everyone can make money out of this game here. So Russian crude or Russian oil will end up in Europe no matter what, but in several formats at the higher price. And the Europeans got stuck. The other issue is Europe will get the Russian crude in a different way because Russia can export fuel oil to some OPEC members right now who are going to burn it in their power plants instead of their own. And literally, they can export their own instead of the Russian crude to Europe. So literally, it is really a Russian crude, but the DNA is not Russian crude. So it's kind of a swap. And everyone is playing the game. At the World Economic Forum, George Soros told uh, WEF attendees that supposedly, and he claimed to have it on very good authority, but he didn't elaborate on what authority that was, he believes that Russia is engaged in a bluff here. And specifically, he thinks that if Russia were unable to sell gas to Europe, it would force them to shut in their producing oil wells because there'd be nothing to do with the gas. Uh, I would think that in Russia, they have flaring stacks like other uh, markets have, and they would have the ability to flare off that gas and continue producing oil. So does George Soros know what he's talking about in this case? Uh, no, not really, because uh, we have associated gas and we have non-associated gas. If you go uh, all the way to the east, for example, there are plenty of fields that are completely gas fields. Uh, they have some liquids. So this might apply to some uh, small oil fields that have some gas in them. But it, it's not a blanket 
uh, statement on all, on everything else. But this is not not really the issue. The issue is, can Europe handle a gas cut under any circumstances? Because the game really is the game of biting fingers. What that means is you have two people, each one is biting the finger of the other, and who is going to scream first? The one who is going to scream first is going to lose, although the difference between the two could be a split second. So both of them will scream, but one of them is going to scream before the other in a split second. And the one who is going to scream first is going to lose, and Europe is going to lose. Europe cannot afford that. Uh, Russia has been running a budget surplus. Russia has been running a trade surplus. They have massive reserves, currency reserves, gold reserves. They can survive a year or two. Europe cannot survive a winter. You already mentioned the winter earlier. They cannot survive that. And that's why they've been delaying those sanctions, because they know they cannot survive. Well, I'm not even sure that they're delaying them. It seems like right now in Europe for politicians, it's very much in vogue to talk tough to Russia. We're not going to let them get away with this. We, we don't need their stinking gas. That's easy to say in June. It's a lot harder to say that in October. And it seems to me like the stage is set for an escalation of this energy crisis around October when Europe realizes we don't have any choice. We have to buy gas from Russia. And I wouldn't be surprised if at that point Russia says, well, guess what? We're not going to sell it to you at any price until you lift all of these sanctions, which Russia considers to be politically motivated and unjust and so forth. So you got to get rid of all your sanctions against Russia or you're not getting another drop of gas. Is that a possibility? And what would that mean for Europe? Eric, the problem is going to be in July and August, not even October. And I'll tell you why. First of all, we had this fire at the LNG plant, and they announced today that's going to take months to repair. So we lost 2BCF a day. That's not going to, to Europe anymore. Where that's going to come from? Where the compensation is going to come from? The other issue is we already have problems with the interconnector uh, in the UK that brings gas to e EU. Uh, something wrong went with that. I mean, last week was a very strange week, and you can see the web of Putin playing all around. I will not be surprised. I'm not talking about conspiracy theory here, but I will not be surprised, basically, if the uh, fire is, is Russian-related and the interconnector is Russian-related. We have Kazakhstan announcing that their produ oil production will be lower. Other countries in that area saying our gas production could be lower. Algeria already an announced, or they are conveying the message that we are going to cut off gas to Spain. The Saudis already said we are not going to send uh, additional amount of oil to China. All of this in the same week where we have the fire and the technical problem in the interconnector. So it gives you a feel like as if Putin working his web in one way or the uh, other, because every time uh, Algeria, Algeria is uh, an ally of Putin. Why they are pressuring Europe right now trying to take advantage of this? What the, Russia, what the Algerians want? They said we need to, to renegotiate the price all of a sudden at this time. So you can see that the Russians are playing the game, and then the Russians basically went to the smaller countries where they have small demand, but those countries will be affected. They start cutting them off. And all of a sudden, now everyone is competing. Everyone said, oh, we don't care because we have enough gas. Well, everyone is looking at the same gas. Everyone is looking at it and saying, we are going to, but when, when Bush comes to shove, everyone wants that gas, and there is only one four four one. So there is a serious problem. The other issue is all the U.S. LNG that is exported to Europe comes from the Gulf of Mexico. And the hurricane season is coming. And we already know that the forecast. We have 21 hurricanes. Five of them are major hurricanes. And we know when we have hurricanes even that are not destructive, that limits the shipping. That delays shipping. So Europe could be in trouble, although their, their storage, their gas storage went up to comfortable level right now, that can be wiped out in days if they don't have any additional supplies coming. Qatar has no, uh, nothing to supply simply because they, everything is contracted. Uh, Algeria has nothing to supply, and if they cut their supplies to, to Spain, it's going to be a major crisis. So where the gas is going to come from? So... I think the crisis is going to happen in the summer, not even October.
Let's quantify how big this gas situation is for Europe. When President Biden made the comment that we could supply as much as they needed, I think everybody knew that that's not really accurate. But how much could we supply? Let's suppose that the United States does what it's able to do with the facilities that we have, the the production capabilities and the export terminals and the ships that are available. And we try to bail out Europe by sending U.S. LNG to Europe. How much of a dent could the U.S. realistically make? Does it does it really change anything for Europe, or are they still completely stuck on Russian gas? Okay. The first one is the largest uh, exporter of gas to Europe right now is the United States. So they did make a dent. So that's n- number one dent. The second dent is caused because the demand at this period, as you know, declines in Europe, and therefore they were able to increase and build up their storage. So that's the second dent, because this storage will be useful in the coming weeks, not months, but in the coming weeks. So we have two dents already in this. The issue here is if Russia, because those contracts, long-term contracts, Russia did not, by the way, stop the flow of gas that is based on long-term contracts. So those long, some of the long-term contracts are coming to an end in the coming months. And Russia basically is saying, I am not going to renew the contract unless you pay me a ruble. And the EU already decided, we will not pay you a ruble. So what's going to happen then? So any cutoff in Russian supplies, that's where the crisis is, because the U.S. cannot compensate for the Russian loss at this stage. Do you think that Russia is likely to stand firm come fall when Europe really needs that gas and say, hey, it's in rubles. That's the story. If you don't like it, buy rubles. You don't have any other choice. Is it really going to come to that or is that a bluff? Uh, They already did it with other countries. I think they've they've done it so far with uh, four or five countries and they, they literally stopped gas supplies to those. The only issue is these are small countries and the amount of gas is small, and therefore it does not cause that much pain in terms of loss of revenues. But we don't know what's going to happen with the larger countries and with the larger contracts, whether there will be a pressure on that or not. And is there any truth to George Soros's allegation that Russia is in a pickle where if they stop exporting the gas, they might be forced to shut in their oil production? The Russians are way smarter than what George Soros is talking about. We already have seen them uh, in actual markets and how they how they operate and work. So it's not only about selling this gas and working deals about this gas. We've seen them basically working deals with uh, in the oil and how they lowered the prices, etc. We've seen them play the game of the ruble because the way they played the game of the ruble is, is this way. Uh, I think it was around the 28th of March when Putin requested that the unfriendly nations in Europe has to, have to pay a ruble for gas. And they have to buy the ruble from the central bank, from the Russian central bank. A couple of days later, it seems that his legal advisors told him, look, we cannot do both. One, because the, the long-term contracts have about 95% of them, the currency is specified. So it's either euro or, or dollar or US dollar. And if you are going to change anything in the contract, you can nullify the whole contract. So you cannot do that. And the fear was those who signed those contracts, if they are forced to pay a ruble and they refused and they go to court, Putin loses because when they go to court, they win because that's what the language of the contract. And then they can go to another court and ask for compensation from the frozen assets of Gazprom and Russia. So they know they will will lose hundreds of millions of dollars, probably more, if this happened. So what they did is two days later, they came up with a system. They said, okay, you buy gas from Gazprom, and you pay for a bank that is related to Gazprom. So what about this? Your contract calls for paying in dollar or euro. Go to this bank bank and pay in dollar or euro so you can fulfill the legal obligations of the contract. And you cannot go to the Russian Central Bank because it's on the list of sanctions, so you don't have to mess with it. Just give us the money, and we will exchange it to ruble. And then in our country, we will open a ruble account in your name, and then we take the money and we pay Gazprom. So it was just a game. And that's how they continued. So 
now Russia can play the same game and continue with it. So, okay, to fulfill the obligation of the EU, let's continue with the same game. You just pay me and I will do the exchange and, and, and we go with that game. But here I would like to illustrate something that is really important and really important for the audience to hear. What are the sanctions on Russia, if, especially th that are energy related? This is why some people cashed on oil and gas and they left the industry in recent months because they thought, you know, there could be problems and why some people basically came to the industry because of this. But both of them are wrong on this. Here is why. Let's start with the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau. Justin Trudeau announced early that he is with Ukraine and he wanted to punish Putin by preventing or stopping crude oil imports from Russia. So he, he issued an order, no more crude oil imports from Russia. But Canada does not import crude oil from Russia. Johnson, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the UK announced publicly to everyone that we are going to stop oil imports from Russia. And then if you look at the details, it says by the end of 2022. You go to, the, to, to Biden when he announced that we are going to stop imports and then he gave them two months leeway where we imported massive amount of, of Russian oil during this period. He and literally announced that we kicked out Russian banks from SWIFT system and it was only some minor banks that are not relevant to international trade that's being pulled out of the, or forced out of the SWIFT system. Shell, the oil company, said that we are not going to buy Russian oil anymore. Then you go to the fine print and it says in the spot market. And then you go company by company. All the service companies, they, people think they left Russia. No, all the service companies said the following, we are going to stop future investment. And what is the new future new investment means? Which means that if you are if you have a contract right now for let's say fifteen billion dollars, and later on you want to expand that, they say, well, this is kind of a brownfield. This is not new. This is an extension, and therefore it's not included in our pledge, not to invest. None of the companies left Russia until today. Not a single oil company. Not a single service company left Russia today. Even McDonald's said we, we left we left uh, Russia. And you go now to Russia and you eat at McDonald's. Why? Because it does not apply to the franchisee. Danon, which is the, uh, as you know, the uh, agricultural company, the French company that has supermarkets and produce yogurt and all that stuff. People think they left Russia. What they said, we are not going to open any new stores in Russia. So everyone is playing around this game of language and even Putin played it to the ruble. Let's move on to what this is going to mean in terms of price transmission to markets. It sounds like you're saying we don't need to wait until the fall heating season when European demand for Russian gas picks up. You think that this comes to a head in markets before that. Does that mean the price goes to the moon or have we already seen the price go to the moon? Uh, this is very hard to tell for the following reasons. What we are waiting right now is we have, of course, remember, we have the substitution between coal, natural gas, and oil uh, in a way that we've never seen before. We've seen some of it historically, but not to the extent that we are seeing right now. If spot LNG goes through the roof, we are going to see switching to oil in power plants. We are going to see private generation going through the roof, especially in China. That's going to put massive pressure on the oil market. So that substitution is going to matter. So we cannot talk about oil prices without talking about natural gas prices or LNG prices in the spot market, because the contract is a completely different game. That's number one. Uh, Biden visit, by the way, to Saudi Arabia. A lot of people say, are saying, well, it's all related. Uh, oil probably is the least important subject in this visit. And one of the main reasons why, because even if Saudis want to cooperate and Biden give the Saudis everything they want, between the time they increase production and that oil reaches the United States, the elections in the United States are over. And the demand, the summer demand for gasoline is over. So the Saudi increase in production at that time, the additional increase is irrelevant. And therefore, uh, there is no reason to waste any political capital on oil discussion. There are more important subjects to focus on. You have the Yemen file, you have the Iran file, you have the Iraqi file, you have the Syrian file, you have the Lebanese file, uh, you have the two islands that Saudi Arabia got back from Egypt. 
uh, you have the uh, Abraham Accord, uh, the role of Israel in the area, and then you have those major investments that Saudi Arabia might make in the United States, etc. Uh, the Saudis are going nuclear. They want to build nuclear plants for power generation. We might see an agreement uh, on this where uh, GE or Westinghouse or others selling the technology to the Saudis, uh, etc. But oil is going to be irrelevant. Uh, climate change is going to be very big on this visit. I think the Saudis will try to show how they are leaders in policies that uh, to, to reach carbon neutrality by 2060. They are going to show off this in every way possible. So oil is going to be irrelevant here. If it is irrelevant, that's bullish for the oil market. So it's very hard to tell. On the other side, you have the, the recession, whether we are already in recession or we are going to head for a recession. So it's very hard to tell where the next few months are going to be. But I can tell you without any reservation that in the medium term and the long term, I am very bullish on oil and natural gas. Let's focus on natural gas specifically in the United States. One of the theories that's been posited by several different analysts is that U.S. and European natural gas prices are set to converge, not necessarily because a direct arbitrage is possible, because of course the transportation cost of LNG is much higher than oil. But the, the thesis is basically that as we get more that is being exported, eventually we're not going to have the surplus that has existed in natural gas for so many years in the United States, and all of a sudden market prices are going to balance out. What that would mean is dramatically, dramatically higher natural gas prices in the United States, because European prices for natural gas are about three times higher than U.S. prices. Is that a realistic concern that we could be looking at dramatically higher U.S. nat gas prices, which would, uh, of course, translate to higher electricity prices as well? Absolutely. In fact, in 2014, I've written a report saying that once LNG exports, that's U.S. LNG exports, exceed 8 BCF a day, what you described is going to happen. And everything happened to the letter in this prediction, although it's from 2014. So uh, it is very clear what you said is absolutely correct. But here are the issues. What we are seeing right here is, I mentioned earlier that Europe became a political football. And what the European did, and that was a big mistake, is shifting all their purchases of spot gas from Russia to the United States. And from an energy security point of view, it's a big mistake. And Europe is going to pay the price dearly for this. And one of the reasons why, I already mentioned earlier the hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico, but if natural gas prices go up to 12 and $14 in the United States, you are going to see politicians who support Ukraine, and they are against Putin, and they support the EU. They are going to say, look, we have to restrict our LNG exports. We heard this with oil, right? We heard this with several senators basically being calling to either to return to the pre-2015 uh, when U.S. crude was not allowed to be exported or at least put some regulations where smaller amounts will be exported. So we are going to see politicians basically pushing uh, this idea that we should limit the exports to Europe. So Europe is in trouble. Where they are going to get that gas? The, the first big move in gas is going to be in 2027. So there is a big gap here. If the U.S. is not going to uh, export to Europe, what Europe is going to do? It's going to go back to, to Russia. The other issues uh, basically is this is a spot market. This is not a contract, a long-term contract market. That's very important because if the Chinese pay or the Koreans or the Japanese pay the American companies more, then that gas is going to move to Asia, not to Europe, because it is a spot contract. So there are several problems here where Europe really got stuck, and they have to really rethink their policies. Otherwise, we are going to see crises in Europe, and we are going to see people dying either from heat or cold. When we talk about the situation in Europe, do they have a substitution option? In other words, if they were willing to compromise on their climate goals and say, okay, look, we're going to go back to a whole bunch of coal-fired power generation rather than that gas because we've got this shortage of gas from Russia, do they even have the ability to do that? That's the sad part is that there is a limited ability to do that. They can go back to some of the old plants, uh, even oil. Some of them still have oil. 
and some of them still have the option on nuclear. But the problem is they close most of it. And to return to it, it will take really long time and massive investment to go back to it. So that optionality exists, but limited. And that's why they got stuck. And the idea that this, of course, they did not put limit on natural gas uh, imports like they did with oil. But they already said that 90% of the oil we import will stop by the end of the year. They are going to extend it. And they have no choice, basically. Otherwise, those governments are going to collapse and, and a new government will come in. So the, the, Putin is winning no matter what, regardless of what the press uh, is saying. So far, we've been talking tactically about what's going to happen between now and the fall heating season in Europe. Let's now step back and take a a bigger, longer-term view. It seems to me, for as long as I've been trading crude oil, everybody was speculating as to how much spare capacity OPEC really has. Is it 10 million barrels, like they think, or is it really only eight? Well, now you're telling me it's about 1.6. Seems like the number, whatever it is, is really pretty darn small. I talked to people in the investment community. We just added a new sponsor, Respect Energy. This guy really gets it. He understands exactly what's going on with oil and gas in Europe and so forth. And I, I, I meet this guy. He's completely plugged in. And then I talked to him about what business he's in. He says, get involved in oil and gas investment now. Are you crazy? You know, we're totally in renewables. That's where the future is. That's where we get the benefit of a tailwind from governmental approval and subsidies and so forth, as opposed to a headwind from governmental disapproval resulting in sanctions and so forth. Why in the world would anybody invest in oil and gas? I see a situation on us where I think that we probably are in the final years of the age of oil, but it seems to me like we've phased out oil and gas before phasing in its replacement. And it seems to me like a setup for those last few years of the oil industry to be defined by an oil and gas crisis where we don't have enough and nobody wants to invest in finding more because there's no future in it. Am I right to think that? And and where could this be headed? You know what is my dream? My dream basically is to leave everything I'm doing and just go to private equity right now and and build a private equity that has over $100 billion to invest in oil and gas, and I'm going to make the case right now. First of all, there is no substitution or very limited substitution between oil and renewable energy. And the reason why? Because renewable energy is used for or to generate electricity. Very little oil is used to generate electricity, whether you are talking about Europe, India, China, US, Canada, Japan, South Korea, etc. A very small percentage, and most of it is related to geographic location or historical reasons. So there is no substitution between renewable energy and oil. If Europe today decides to double its uh, renewable energy, it has no impact on oil. That's number one. Number two, We have a serious problem right now with the forecast because the first issue is, if you look at the long-term forecast, the first mistake that they assume the largest drop in oil demand in the future is not coming from electric vehicles. It's coming from the improvement in efficiency of ICE engine, internal combustion engines, which means uh, gasoline and diesel. But if you look at their numbers, they think that between now and in the next 25 years, the demand for oil will decline between 8 to 12 million barrels a day just because of the improvement in ICE engines. So notice this. They are talking about ICE engines in 2045. So what the heck when, when people say we are, this is... Uh, they are themselves talking about this. The irony is, if you look at the efficiency they are predicting, I don't need electric vehicles because those cars will be more environmental friendly than electric vehicles and way, way, way cheaper. And the infrastructure is already there. I don't need a new infrastructure. So you can see the contradiction. So we have exaggeration in this improvement in efficiency. We had the low-hanging fruit in the 80s. We already improved the, the efficiency of the engines. Technology maxed out. We used lighter metals. We cannot use any lighter metals right now simply because the cost of the car will go up. Like if you look at Ford 150, uh, it, it will go up, let's say, from $60,000 to about one hundred ten. So Ford is not going to do it. 
and we are using smaller cars, we cannot make cars smaller than our bodies. So we maxed out on everything, and therefore those estimates of a decline of 8 to 12 million is absolutely incorrect. It never happened in history, and there is no reason for it to happen in the, in the future. So we are going to be short probably four, five, six million barrels a day that increase in demand because of the failure of forecast of the green policies that is not there. The other issue on electric vehicles, we have major exaggeration. I mean, look at it this way. When you look at when they tell you we are going to have this 200 or 300 or 700 million uh, uh, vehicles, guess what? They are including scooters and electric bicycles. Well, if you are replacing a regular bicycle with an electric bicycle, that's wh where is the uh, gasoline saving in this case? And uh, look at the numbers. They are assuming, for example, and this is true story, one major city is going to change its buses to electric buses. And the major reports that are without naming names are saying that this is going to save us 60,000 barrels a day. So demand for oil will decline by 60,000 barrels a day because this big city is changing its buses to electric buses. Here is the problem. This city does not have a single diesel bus. All the buses run on CNG, compressed natural gas. So the impact basically is coming, it will be on natural gas demand, not on oil. So there are all kinds of exaggeration and lies about those, those numbers. And the compensation basically is, well, demand is not going to decline by 60,000. Therefore, where are that 60,000 is going to come from? The final point is why I'm very bullish on oil is uh, we are right now, the global demand is about 100 million barrels a day. To keep oil demand at 100 million barrels a day in 2050, we need at least 700 million electric vehicles on the road. And when I talk about vehicles, I'm talking about real four-wheel cars. 700 million. How many we have? We have less than 30 million right now. So in 30 years, I'm supposed to have all that, almost all that 700 million. This is not the story. Here is the story. That 100 million, even if you go with the decline in demand, let's assume that demand is going to decline, and, and today it's 100, it's going to go probably to 112, 115, like some people are predicting, and then it's going to decline to 75. That 75 million barrels a day in 2050 has to be completely fresh oil. That we don't have today. I need trillions of dollars of investment to have that 75 million by 2050. A decline in demand does not mean lower prices. I might end up with 75 million in 2050 and the price of oil is $500. Honest, I want to go back to your pitch for the, the multi hundred billion dollar private equity fund that's going to rescue oil and gas. First of all, right now, it is completely not viable as an investment vehicle because anybody with an ESG mandate is unable to invest in it even if they want to, even if they agree with you. And eventually, I think that will change. But I want to go through this scenario. Let's imagine for the next two or three years that it is just not viable to create that investment vehicle because nobody's allowed to invest in it, even if they want to, because of misplaced ESG mandates. Eventually, I predict that as people get their heads around just how big the cost of this great energy transition that our, uh, our elite leaders are pitching to us, when they get their heads around how expensive that's going to be, I think you're going to see a change in the politics, uh, a change in government attitudes, and a realization that we really do need to invest in oil and gas, I'd say three to five years into the future from now. If it happens then, and we have to pick up the pieces at that point and say, okay, how are we going to take care of all of the spare capacity which has eroded, the production capacity which has declined as all producing oil wells do decline in their production ability over time. Uh, and we have to play catch up and start at that point five years into the future. And all of a sudden it becomes okay again to invest in oil and gas. Uh, I would argue at that point, we're already screwed. We, we've gotten to the point where we're so underwater and so out of spare capacity that prices are going to be debilitating. You are absolutely correct. And, and that's why we are going to see uh, if you want to talk about the Arab Spring being repeated in other countries, changing governments, 
unstable governments, which means that a government will go for an election and then it will fall two months later and then another election and then it will fall another two months later. Because that's really, I mean, it, your description is a perfect description of the crisis that I'm talking about. That it's too late already, we can reduce it a little bit, but it's going to be crisis no matter what. All we can do is, instead of uh, having this uh, mega crisis, probably it's a little bit smaller. Because not only ESG, basically, and, and there is a good news, by the way, about ESG. Uh, the good news is, the same way I explained how politicians played with the sanctions and they promised things that were totally false or irrelevant, we are seeing the same thing with ESG. Exactly the same thing. I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, when uh, companies, basically, I, I call those scavengers. Scavengers are the companies who set goals to reach carbon neutrality, and then they told their people, look, look at my history and what I have today and see what I've been doing green already. So companies like Target, like Walmart, and all those big mega stores basically found out that they've been green already a long time ago. Why? Because they have those skylights in those stores, and they counted that. But that's been there for 40 years. So you can see how everyone is playing the game. Companies, major companies that has, let's say, big campuses with 2,000 trees on campus, they are counting the carbon that sequestered by those trees right now. But those trees are 100 years old. Companies that decided to downsize because of corona, they, they counted the downsizing toward their climate change goals. So it sounds like we are in agreement on us that we've reached a point where a major global energy crisis is inevitable. And that crisis is defined essentially by our political leaders' policy taking away investment in producing oil and gas resources before the replacement had realistically been phased in. Am I right that at this point it's just too late to avoid that crisis? It's coming no matter what? Absolutely. It just we can influence the size of it, the size of that crisis. We can mitigate some, some of it, but you are absolutely correct. And that's why when I talked about, by the way, I talked about the, 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 the dream and what I hope for, because I agree with you that it's very difficult to build such a private equity. But the idea here is we need someone who had the right vision for the future, basically, to manage those investments because people are going crazy. Uh, for example, let me give you a, a, an example on, on how crazy it is right now. When you have major funds divesting from energy, they are rabbits. I mentioned scavengers earlier. They are, those guys are rabbits. Why they are rabbits? Because if you really care about climate change, you just left the table to someone who does not care because you sold your assets to someone who does not care or care less than you. So you are being a chicken. You chickened out. You are not fighting for climate change. You just made the situation worse. So those who are divesting, basically, and they believe they are standing for climate change, it's exactly the opposite. And uh, to give you another example, let's say I'm an energy company and I own several assets, including a refinery. And my refinery is 80 years old, and most of my carbon footprint is coming from that refinery. And I have a mandate, basically, to get greener from my board. All I get to do, basically, is sell that refinery and come back to the board and show them how I reduced my footprint by 60%. But someone else bought that refinery. So the carbon is still there. The society, the globe, did not change. Anas, final question for our investors in the audience who want to make money and maybe even do a little bit of good along the way by being smart about this. What do you do from an investment play standpoint to both help the problem and take advantage of the economic opportunities? Because I think, unfortunately, that you're right. We are headed toward an inevitable global energy crisis, which is going to be a major big deal and probably contribute to a global food crisis, which uh, is also in the making. How do we make this better? Where are the investment plays? How do you make money on this? Investors must realize that we have governments, we have markets, and we have unintended consequences to government regulations. They must realize that all the ESG and the climate change policies and the carbon neutrality policies basically are representative of government wishes 
not what happened actually in the market. So if you put those t three parts together, you end up with the idea that we should focus on the unintended consequences and the power of markets. For God's sake, people sin because of the power of markets, although they are religious and believers. But the power of markets is so powerful, it trumps even religion in this case. So they need to focus on those unintended consequences, how the power of markets basically trump and overrun government regulations and how people be behave on the ground. And if they do that, they realize that we are heading for that major energy crisis. And if they prepare their investment for that, they will make a lot of money. Anas, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. But before I let you go, I want to talk a little bit about the work that you do. When I first met you before the COVID crisis, you were one of the most sought after keynote speakers uh, on the global energy circuit. Are you able to do any of that public speaking now that the uh, crisis is winding down? And if so, where will you be speaking? And what else can uh, people do to follow your work? Sure. Uh, I am back in the speaking circle uh, globally. Most of my talks basically are uh, international, but I do have three, four of them. I cannot talk about them because they are private events uh, here in the United States, mostly to board members and the financial uh, community. The best place, I do have a website. Unfortunately, I was not able to update it, but it's uh, my first name, my last name, Anas Alhaji, A-N-A-S-A-L-H-A-J-J-I. The same thing with my Twitter handle is the same thing. Uh, people can reach me on Twitter too because I put a lot of stuff on Twitter. And uh, I urge people two things here. The first one is when I put stuff on Twitter because of certain things, they need to read between the lines. I'm not going to be very clear on some issues on purpose by design, and I think people understand that. So they need to understand this. I can convey it in, in private speaking engagements and explain it, but I cannot say it publicly. The other one is I tweet a lot of things in Arabic, very valuable information in Arabic. And when people see a tweet in Arabic, Twitter has a function, which is the translate function in the bottom left of the tweet, of every tweet. All they get to do, just press that translate, and they get it in the language they need. So don't look at the Arabic thing and just let it go, because there are some really valuable information, sometimes breaking news. Like today, for example, there was breaking news that the waiter's story about OPEC 2023 forecast is absolutely not correct. And that was published first in Arabic. So they can get the breaking news, too, by clicking on that translate button. Well, Anas, I strongly concur. Having uh, translated your Arabic tweets for several years, they definitely are an excellent source of information that should not be missed. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right after this. After being completely sold out of advertising space for the last couple of years, we finally have capacity to add a new advertiser. Macro Voices has a PodTrack certified global audience of over 170,000 listeners, and each weekly episode typically gets 60,000 to 80,000 downloads. We have more than 20,000 accredited investors who have registered with us as accredited, and we estimate the total accredited investor audience as at least 40,000 accredited listeners, which we believe to be the highest number of accredited investor listeners of any podcast on the Internet. We strive to accept tasteful advertising from advertisers whose product is likely to appeal to our audience. So we're looking for another investment or financial services advertiser to fill the space I'm speaking in right now. Mail order Viagra salesmen need not apply. If your company wants to advertise on Macro Voices, please email sponsorship at macrovoices.com for more information. Now let's get right back to the show. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Wow, Eric, there is so much to unpack in that interview. I think I'm going to have to listen to that one again. I don't think I've heard that many truth bombs in one interview on Macro Voices this year yet. What did you take away from this? 
Patrick, I really want to talk about the perfect storm that I see brewing here, which is the combination of runaway energy prices and runaway food prices. But in the case of food, I don't think it's just runaway prices. I think it's just outright shortages, not being able to get certain types of food and uh, a lot of people around the world suffering as a result. And of course, that has serious knock-on effects and consequences in terms of civil unrest and regime change in, in smaller nations and all kinds of things that it brings on. Why do I think that? Well, you just heard the first half of it in this interview with Dr. Anas Alhaji. I think Anas is spot on in a lot of his views. I think that we still have a lot of really serious challenges ahead of us. And unfortunately, the current presidential administration is working against the uh, interests of the nation and the energy industry, as far as I'm concerned. One place I do want to actually compliment the Biden administration, since I criticize them so frequently, is I'm really glad to see President Biden talking to the American people and trying to persuade them that they should embrace this, I think he calls it the great transition, as a good thing. And we should be happy to pay through the nose for energy and not, not worry about prices at the pump because it's a necessary strategic expense to get us to where we want to get to, which is green energy. Finally, we're starting to put a price tag on the cost of these things. So for decades now, Patrick, every loyal, greeny, uh, you know, virtue signaling millennial has been standing up and, and saying, we need to move to green energy. We need to completely phase out oil and gas and let's outlaw fracking and let's do it tomorrow. This is the way we make progress. Well, we're finally starting to put a price. Those are all good messages that we need to do all of those things, but they come at a very, very significant economic cost. And it's not a matter of just saying it sounds good and doing it because it feels good. We need to actually understand those costs, plan for them, and make intelligent choices. And we're not doing that here. And I think, unfortunately, U.S. energy policy is going to be one of the biggest detriments in this picture. Now, the second half of the perfect storm is the so-called coming food crisis, which I'm sure a lot of our listeners have read about. How would you guys like to hear an interview with somebody just as smart as Anas Alhaji, who really understands the macro, the big picture, and this fertilizer shortage, which is going on globally, and a lot of it has to do with the Russia-Ukraine war. How big of a deal is this? If the Russia-Ukraine war gets resolved somehow miraculously, how long does it take to recover to get back to where fertilizer prices come back to normal? What does that mean in terms of crops? What is it going to mean in terms of the uh, agriculture and food industry generally being able to deliver the food needed to feed all of the people on the planet? Do you know who the perfect guest is? If you do, be sure to tell us, because we've been trying to figure that out. This is a, a story that we've been reading a lot about. I think that there is a coming food crisis. I'm just having a hard time getting my head around how big of a deal it really is. Because if you read the conspiracy theory blogs, you know, they're saying that the coming crisis is going to half the people on the planet are going to die of famine and so forth. Uh, obviously, it's not quite that bad. Is it really a really big deal? perhaps as big of a deal as the COVID pandemic? Or is it just a financial anomaly that's going to cost some people in the futures market and not be that big of a deal? I'm kind of leaning toward the former, but I'd like to find the ideal expert guest. So if you know who that person is, please be sure to let us know. But we, we're really trying to watch the combination of food and energy running away after Jay Powell just told us in this week's press conference that food and energy are completely outside the Fed's control and they have no tools to deal with it when that happens. I think we are headed to that situation. And certainly while the war between Russia and Ukraine is contributing rather substantially to those problems, it's not the root cause of them. We had these problems before Russia-Ukraine war ever broke out. But let me get off of my soapbox now, Patrick. Let's move on to this week's post-game chart deck, which is titled Sizing Up the Liquidity Event Risks. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com. Click the red button that says, looking for the download. Patrick, sizing up liquidity event risks. Page two, we got the S&P 500 futures chart. Boy, taking a nosedive there. And it all started right after that CPI print. 
Yeah, Eric, uh, let me just start off by making one bigger point, uh, which is that uh, fundamentals matter and they, they matter over the long term. But over the short term in the markets, liquidity is uh, the driver of short term volatility that converges or diverges away from those fundamentals. The thing is, is that uh, when we enter a period where there's margin calls and liquidity, it doesn't matter the quality of the name. Everything sells under those conditions and the correlation of all assets goes to one. And so the bigger question that I'm trying to, to ask is that have we now started to transition to what you in the market wrap at the beginning were talking about where something bigger may happen? And one of those things that starts to emerge is when it stops being sector rotation to everything selling all at once. And if you look at and reflect on the first four or five months of the year, we had very clear sector rotation. We had strong performance in utilities, strong performance in some of the healthcare names, uh, in some of the consumer staples. There was defensiveness in those high dividend paying kind of stable names while it was rotating out of tech. And we saw the selling in really a specific sector group. But what we have now seen in the last week was there is nowhere to hide. And so I want to start on page three and really reflect on the fact that and when you look at the heat map of the last week, there was nowhere to hide, no sector that was safe. Everything, including energy stocks, have been selling throughout this cycle, which is like one big almost margin call on the whole market. And when you look at the way that the market reacted, going back to page two on the S&P, and uh, the, to the uh, Fed giving the market basically what they priced in, uh, we had a, about a 100-point and intraday rally, which was not even close to a 50% retracement of the three days of carnage that happened earlier in the week, and uh, immediately rolled over and sold. This is uh, starting to be a very worrisome around amount of selling. Now, typically, when you hear worrisome, you think that, well, that oversold conditions are, are, are bad. Sentiment is probably the worst we've seen. It must be close to a bottom. But yet, we have not seen panic. Look at page three and just look at volatility and the VIX. When you think of uh, March 2020, when we were uh, on Macro Voices here talking through the COVID crash, I mean, volatility was blowing out. There was there was, uh, you know, crazy moves in the market and uh, people were grabbing at volatility premiums and gamma to be able to hedge out risk. But yet, look at where we're today. We have not seen any genuine fear reflected on the willingness of people to pay up for volatility premium. And to me, that means that we have not yet seen the capitulation moment in the selling. And that's, to me, a little bit scary. Now, I don't want to say that I can guarantee a market crash or that there's any certainty. But the thing is, is that if anyone is trying to already call a market bottom, because I don't see the, the signs yet. And therefore, I'm kind of approaching this as a strap on the seatbelts because uh, there's a lot of things that can happen here. And we're breaking through key technical levels and uh, stress points are being cracked. And, you know, once we get past this option expiration this weekend, which could arguably pin the market uh, going into Friday. But uh, after that... There's a lot of things that can go wrong, and uh, I'm uh, I'm playing defense. I've I've hedged a lot of the things I own, and I, I'm uh, raising a lot of cash. What's your take on that, Patrick? I agree, but I think the emphasis, at least to my thinking, is primarily on inflation. The reason we saw that relief rally that got us back up almost to the 50-day moving average was because people thought that the peak for inflation was in and that it really was going to be transitory and so forth. Then we saw that runaway CPI print last Friday, and really the bottom has fallen out since then. And as you said, Patrick, we have yet to see anything resembling crash conditions. What we've seen has been a 20% sell-off in the S&P, but it's been a very orderly sell-off. It really has not been a crash. What we've seen in the last week is starting to look like the beginnings, maybe, of a crash. And if so, this is just the beginning. So I think that the S&P bottoming in October or early November in you know some kind of a two-handle below 3,000 is entirely possible. 
Let's move on to the Euro-US dollar cross, which we have charted on page five. Yeah, you know, this is, uh, to me, still the chart to watch in the currency markets. While we have had this extraordinary move on the yen and the JGBs just had a, a, a crazy break as the yield curve control thing is uh, starting to be put into question, and we've seen even the pound sterling break to a, a lower low, the euro has resiliently not broken and held the May lows. And uh, this is the big question for me, because once we break to a lower low, that low in May is not just the 52-week low, but that's actually where the decade low is for the euro. And once we break below that level, not only is parity in, in sight, but maybe even we would see something fall under parity for the first time in, an, uh, in almost two decades on the euro. And that would certainly put in motion a significant U.S. dollar uh, move. And so to me, uh, my eyes are on this euro to see whether or not that level holds along that previous low or whether or not uh, that we're going to see that break next week. Well, Patrick, now that I see this chart, it really helps to make the case that maybe that breakout we saw to a new high on the dollar index was a fake break after all. Because as you just said, what we really were looking for was for a further breakdown in the euro to a new low. And we didn't get that. The dollar index breaking out to a new high sounds like it happened because of the yen, not because of the euro. And yeah, that counts. But I think, as you said, the real test is the euro breaking lower. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Let's move on to page six in the deck. I don't know if I should interpret you adding a Bitcoin chart as meaning that you've uh, suddenly become a coiner. What's going on here? Well, listen, I, I just wanted to technically observe the really difficult time uh, cryptocurrencies are having. And um, obviously, there's all sorts of stable coins that are blowing up right or left. But really, um, the big boys like Bitcoin and Ether um, are struggling here. And we had a, a tight trade range from over a month in Bitcoin that that just uh, like 10,000 points drop just happened within a week. And, uh, and the carnage is there and the momentum to the downside is just, it seems unstoppable at this stage. It'll be really interesting to see whether or not 20,000 holds this or whether we're going into the teens on um, the Bitcoin price. But uh, uh, such a distinctly clear bearish downtrend uh, and it's just coming to some key round numbers. And I'll be really curious whether that holds the line here. You know, we just got an email from one of our listeners who owns a restaurant and uh, told us that a whole bunch of restaurant employees have been lost in the last few years because they all got rich on Bitcoin. They're all coming back looking for jobs working at minimum wage in restaurants again. Uh, so I don't know if that's a, a meaningful economic barometer or not, but it's one data point. Let's move on to crude oil futures on page seven, my favorite topic. Yeah, and I took this uh, snapshot a couple hours ago, and it's quite old now all of a sudden. Uh, yeah, the, there was quite an intraday reversal. Uh, you know what? Uh, to me, uh, the interesting part, uh, for and, and it still, I think, it remains a little bit of a risk, because uh, while I, you know, we heard that great uh, interview with Anas, uh, you know, I still think on the short term, if we have a liquidity event and, and a margin event, then there's a chance that uh, oil temporarily gets trapped in a liquidity event. And I still would view that as a buy on debt. The, the bigger question is, is there, are we going to see some of that selling pressure kind of spill temporarily into oil that will offer that buy on dip? Or is it already done and just upside from here? Like uh, while I remain bullish oil, it is uh, hard for me to imagine the entire uh, risk asset intermarkets all selling and oil just uh, ignoring everything and just trucking along onto the upside. I think uh, that there's going to be some short-term volatility here, but it's uh, probably a buy on dip on any opportunity that's offered. I agree, but I think it's a deeper dip than we've seen so far. I think we could easily get back down to 100 bucks or below 100 bucks just on the market coming around to recognize that a recession is coming for the U.S. Uh, one of the things I thought was interesting about Jay Powell's presser, you know, one of the old adages in, in media is that the first step in confirming a speculative rumor is when it's officially denied by the government. Well, Jay Powell went out of his way to say explicitly that the Fed is not trying to intentionally engineer a recession. So uh, take that as you will in terms of what it might mean. 
when the rest of the market comes around to recognize something that we've been talking about on Macro Voices for months now, which is that a recession probably is coming for the United States, uh, I think a hundred dollar test or so to uh, or, or lower than that to sort of wash out the speculative froth is definitely in the cards. But then the fundamentals will kick back in and we move back up to higher prices. Right. You know, uh, I want to move on to the Nat Gas chart because uh, there there is a much clearer uh, correction that is evident there. The oil obviously recovered much quicker, but Nat Gas uh, broke pretty heavily. And it, uh, it, it kind of uh, reflects a lot like the correction we had in May. The interesting part to me will be back in May after that two-day little quick drop, the bulls just got right back to business and, and took natural gas again to higher prices. I think the big problem price action thing to watch in the next week is are we going to have a repeat of that type of price action where we got a quick correction and the buy on dip traders quickly work this right north of eight dollars again and get nat gas going on the upside or is it different this time where the rallies start failing and so maybe some short-term tops start to emerge on nat gas futures like we and you are talking about the term structure on nat gas and how it's not really pricing in higher nat gas prices beyond the 2020 22 period on on the term structure and it will be interesting to see whether nat gas goes through a little bit of a deeper correction here and we see uh, 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 more uh, some of that backwardation get taken out of the market any any thoughts on that well patrick i think the real story on natural gas is going to center on what happens to europe particularly as we get into the fall and they need Russian natural gas for heating and potentially they can't get it unless they pay in rubles and what all the consequences of that are going to be. I think the reason that we saw such a pronounced sell-off in natural gas was because of an explosion in a natural gas facility in the United States that caused a lot of people to think that it meant that the U.S. was not going to be able to export as much gas to Europe as originally planned. And so that explains why we've seen that volatility. But at the end of the day, we're going to get to a situation before the summer is out where the world realizes that there is no alternative to natural gas for heating Europe. Europe in the 2022-23 heating season. And if you can't get the gas and Russia doesn't want to sell it to you or they'll only sell it in rubles and you can't get the rubles or, you know, there's so many things that are coming, I think we're going to see global natural gas prices to the moon. Now, it's entirely possible that if there's a change in U.S. policy and the, the promises to export so much natural gas change for some reason, well, that, that could change the equation to the downside in the U.S. But short of that, I think it's uh, much higher in net gas prices. All right, well, let's move on to the gold chart because, you know, you basically um, were highlighting the way that I was reflecting on the little rally we had today. And just to, to give uh, some validation to your point, the argument I was saying was simply the fact that it's not down like everything else today, but like the chart is still distinctly a bearish chart. Uh, there is no evidence of a new uptrend in any way. I mean, it did find support along its, the 1800 level along the low. Now, during a liquidity event, we certainly have room to retest some of those lows towards 1750. And that is uh, the reality, I think, on the short term of gold. But uh, it is at least interesting that we're not seeing the U.S. dollar rallying much. And we've seen correlation in the last uh, half year very much stick with gold behaving very much like a cross currency to the dollar. So I think uh, watching what happens with that euro will actually correlate a lot with what gold's next move is. One way or another, uh, I think that there will be a great buying opportunity on gold. But on the short term, you're right that there is not an uptrend and there is no evidence of, uh, of a reversal beyond just one little up day. I think uh, there's still a lot to be determined here in gold going into the summer. Let's move on to the 10-year yield on page 10. Right. And I just wanted to highlight that just to, to again, uh, reconfirm what you were saying is that once we cleared 3%, it clearly was uh, the kind of 
uh, fear moment uh, as yield started to really blow out. Right now, there are a number of these uh, ways to approach this. I mean, I think at this stage, 4% is not out of line. And while we certainly have seen the last few days in the post-FOMC, these uh, the yields kind of stall out a little bit. And it, uh, it would be actually technically significant to me if we didn't hit 4%, because that would actually be divergent momentum if we see stalling here, as it would really kind of uh, start to show that we're reaching the kind of upper boundary of where this was going to go before recession kicks in. Uh, Now, I'm not uh, trying to make any bold call here, but it would be a natural move to see this work its way toward 4%. And it would be significant in my mind if it didn't hit it. And that's certainly going to be something I want to watch with our listeners over the uh, going into July. Folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading, Patrick's trading service. Sign up information is on page 11 or just go to bigpicturetrading.com. We're going to leave it there for this week's show. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy and a one-stop shop for all green energy investors. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's Research Roundup. Well, this week, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to the chart book we just discussed here in the post game, and a link to a number of articles that we found really interesting. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners, and we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at research roundup at macrovoices.com and we will consider it for our weekly distributions if you have not already follow our main twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases you can also follow me at patrick serezna on behalf of eric townsend and myself thank you for listening and we'll see you all next week That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>